So we've talked about the vector equation of a line. Let's now move into curves, and in particular, the circle. In two dimensions, if you think back to complex numbers, we've seen it. Because you can think of it as modulus, if you like. And we know that with complex numbers, when we had a modulus of z minus some complex number equals a number, we got a circle. That's effectively the same thing. Uh, that would be a vector equation of a circle in two dimensions. Centre would be v naught, and radius is r unit. So if I break it up into its components, x minus x naught in the i direction, y minus y naught in the j direction, and then we know, well, that will be x minus x naught squared plus y minus y naught squared equals the radius squared, what we recognise to be be the Cartesian equation of a circle. Now, we know cos squared plus sine squared is 1. If I multiply everything by r squared, and then let x minus x naught equal r cos theta, y minus y naught is r sine theta, we come up with parametrics. So x equals x naught plus r cos theta, y equals y naught plus r sine theta, which I can say, well, there's the parametric equation of a circle. Okay, I've written them as column vectors, but if you read across, you would get the parametrics, r being the parameter in this case. So let's show that this represents a circle. I've got the same thing dotted by itself. Well, if that's the case, remember, u dot u is the magnitude of u squared. I can say, well, that's the magnitude of r minus 2i plus 3j squared. Take the square root of both sides, and it's now in a form that we now recognize to be a circle. We've got r minus the center is 2 root 3. So the center would be the point 2, negative 3, and the radius is 2 root 3 units. Find a vector equation of the tangent to this circle at the point 3, 4. Okay, I'll draw myself a picture. Now, r, if I just place it somewhere on that tangent, because I want a vector equation, I was like, well, the vector pr, head minus tail, would be r minus 3i minus 4j. Now, I also know the position vector of p. It's going to be 3i plus 4j. But you'll recall that the radius is perpendicular to the tangent. So their dot product would equal zero. Theoretically, that is a vector equation. It's an equation that involves vectors. And it must represent that circle. That dot of that is equal to zero. We have a vector equation of a tangent. Yeah, OK, it's not written the way we saw a vector equation of lines before. Oh, we could play around with it and dot it out and get all that. But that is a vector equation, albeit in a different format. Find the Cartesian equation now of that tangent. Oh, all right. So now we're going to have to use the dot product anyway. Now let's do that. Uh, it'll be 3 times x minus 3 plus 4y minus 4. And I'd put it in general form, but there it is. 3x plus 4y minus 25 is equal to 0. Let's now push through to three dimensions. The vector equation of a sphere. What do you know? Same equation. Because now it's just in three dimensions, but we're still saying the same thing. The length of the vector joined to a particular point is always the same. No matter where you go in three dimensions, you must get a sphere. The centre will be v naught, radius will be r. Just the same idea, push through to three dimensions. All right, let's get a Cartesian equation. What would the difference be if I actually find the modulus of that, then you see we get a very familiar equation similar to everything else we saw with going from 2 to 3. It's basically got the same form, but now we're adding the z coordinates in as well. So we'll get x minus x naught squared plus y minus y naught squared plus z minus z naught squared is the radius squared. That would be a, a sphere. The parametric equation of a sphere, I, I haven't bothered to go and prove this one, is a little bit more interesting in that you'll see you've got the uh, parameter here of r, which you could pull out, but there's actually two angles controlling the sphere. Theta's in three of them there, and uh, phi is in, in two of them as well. But it ends up being something like that. We've got these two spheres, and we're told they intersect in a circle. If you imagine 3D, think of it like, oh, I'll slice a bit off this tennis ball, I'll slice a bit off this tennis ball, join them together, they'd be joining in a circle. So we want to find what is the equation of that circle. Well, first of all, sorry, they want us to find the plane that it lies on. Now, they've been very nice to us with these simultaneous equations because you'll notice the x plus 2 squared is the same in both and the y plus 3. They will eliminate very nicely 
and we get y plus 2 squared minus z minus 4 squared is 9 uh, and I end up with just z is 7 on 4. So it's a plane which is parallel to the xy plane but at a height of 7 on 4. Well now let's go and find the centre and radius of that intersecting circle. We'll just go back and substitute in. We don't actually have to find x and y of course because we're just going for the equation of a circle. So x plus 2 squared plus y plus 3 squared plus, and now I'll substitute in z is 7 on 4 because we know that's the plane it's lying on. Uh, playing around with that, we now get an equation of a circle. So there's its centre, but be careful with this one. Don't forget to put the z coordinate in. You, know, you see something like that and we're so used to saying, oh, the centre is negative 2, negative 3. But yes, it's negative 2, negative 3, but also 7 on 4 would be its z coordinate because it's lying on that particular plane. This time we're going to find intersection points of our sphere and a line. The magnitude of our sphere, the radius, is 4. That means that the i component is lambda i, the j component is 2 minus 4, so negative 2, and the k component is 3 minus 2. Okay, 3 minus 2 lambda. Lambda then is... Ugh, Oh well, it is what it is. No one said the numbers had to be nice. 6 plus or minus the square root of 51 on 5. Subbing back in then to the different components, x then is 1 plus 6 plus or minus 1 on root 51 on 5. y is just a constant 2. There was no lambda in the j component. Z is 3 minus 2 lots of that, so minus 12 plus or minus 2. So therefore, the two points of intersection will be 11 plus root 51 on 5, 2, and then 3, well, we're going 3 minus, probably easier to think of 3 as uh, 15 on 5, isn't it? So 15 minus 12 is 3, and then we'll have well, it's minus the fraction, so the plus becomes a minus 2 root 51, and then the other one becomes a plus 2 root 51 on 5. At our points of intersect. This one's very interesting. Let V be the position vector of a point P on a sphere S with centre C and radius R. The length of the vector, or the magnitude, of V minus C is R, where C is OC. The equation of the line L through P in the direction of the vector M and then W equals V plus lambda M. So that's the equation of our line. Draw a picture. Let's try and see what's going on here. So we have a sphere. P is on the sphere. The tangent goes through the sphere. So it'll, somewhere else on the sphere it's going to intersect. And that's our random point W. That's the equation we're trying to find. What's W? And the equation of the vector will be, well, a point that it goes through. Well, we said it goes through V, so we know that. Plus lambda times the direction vector. And they told me the direction vector was M. So that's where this equation is coming from. So there's our picture. We have to find the values of lambda that correspond to the intersection of the line L there's the line L, and the sphere S. Okay, so what do we know? We know the radius of our sphere is R, and if W is also on the surface, then the length of that vector there from C to W must also be R. So head minus tail, that must be R. We know that. But we said W is equal to V plus lambda M. So I'll substitute that in for W. Now that must equal R. Okay, I'm going to use the dot product here. Remember magnitude squared. So that squared would be R squared, but I'll write it as that dot that rather than the magnitude. Because now I can expand this out and see what happens. So we'll get V minus C dot V minus C twice lambda V minus C dot M and then lambda squared M dot M. Okay. V minus C dot V minus C, that's magnitude of V minus C squared. And at the other end of it, M dot M will be the magnitude of M squared. The middle bit I've just left in the dot product. 
But V minus C, the magnitude of V minus C. Oh, hang on, that's the radius. That was the length of that vector. So I know that's R squared. That's nice, because that will cancel with the R squared on the other side. I now have it down to this. We want to find values of lambda. But they said I can leave my answers in terms of V, C, and M. Now, if I have a look here, that's all I've got. I've got V, I've got C, I've got M, and I've got lambda. Should be able to make lambda the subject of this and come up with an expression. All right, a common factor of lambda, I'll take that out. Well, there it is. It's ugly, but I've done what they've asked. There's a nice easy one. Either lambda is equal to zero, that's a possibility, or the other one is that lambda is 2m dot c minus v over the magnitude of m squared, and that satisfies what they said. They said find lambda in terms of m, c, and v, those vectors. Well, that's what we've done. Oh, it goes further. Deduce that the line L is a tangent to the sphere. If and only if m dot v minus c is zero and interpret that geometrically. Well, if L is a tangent, there's only one point of intersection. So W, remember W is just that random point on the sphere. Well, now it has to be v because there's only one point of intersection. So it has to be v. That now means that v plus lambda m must equal v. Well, there's only one way that's going to happen, and that's if lambda equals zero. Well, the first one, lambda, is already equal to zero, so that's not an issue. But it also means that the other one has to be zero as well. So minus 2m dot c minus v over lambda squared has to equal zero. Hang on. That means the top of the fraction must be zero. So m dot v minus c must equal zero. And there it is. So geometrically, what does it mean? Well, basically it's saying, well, the dot product equals zero, then the tangent is perpendicular to the radius. M, the direction vector, dot V minus C, well, that was the radius, they're perpendicular. There's our geometrical interpretation. Last example, and it comes from last year's HSC. Uh, the last couple of years, they, they got interested with these spirals or helixes, giving them the correct name. And this particular helix winds around the sphere. So it's always on the surface. Uh, it's passed three times around it, centered at the origin. They gave us a picture. It's starting down here at the bottom at 0, 0, negative 3, ends up at the top at 0, 0, 3. By using the diagram below, I've got to be honest with you, I didn't use the diagram below. So it shows those graphs, function x and g of x. And then they've given us a hint by considering y equals those two multiplied together. Give a possible set of parametric equations and describe the curve. Looking at this, I said, well, I'm going to make z the parameter. Because look, we're starting down here and moving up. Basically, z is what's changing. Isn't it? Let's make life easy for ourselves and we'll just make z the parameter. And then what's happening as it changes? In other words, I'll just let z equal some pronumeral. I've called it t. I've sub called function t cos pi 2 root 9 minus t squared. Those two things multiplied together. That was the hint they gave me, considering those two functions multiplied together. So when I look at function 0, I just subbed in a value for t, so when it's at the middle, I get an answer of 3. So I know that when z equals 0, x is equal to 3. Let x equal cos pi t root 9 minus t squared. Now I know the equation of a sphere, remember it's on the surface of the sphere, this helix, is x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 9. So if I substitute in, I get that the y value at that same point is plus or minus. I've just got to work out which one's going to give me the correct parametrics. It's going to be plus or minus the sine of pi t root 9 minus t squared. Now if you go back to that diagram and have a look at how it leaves, it starts at the bottom and then it moves. So when it leaves, the y value is negative. So it must have been minus the sine pi t so there's a possible parametric then. If I make x equal cos pi t root 9 minus t squared, y is minus sine pi t root 9 minus t squared, and the z coordinate is just simply t, I've got one. I mean, there's, there's probably other possible ones you could come up with. 
but that, that's the one I, I came up with for that one. Just finish off. Just some pictures of some other common things in 3D. Now the plane. This is something we've seen, but we only looked at planes that were parallel to the XY plane and things like that, and you got Z is equal to a constant, or Y is equal to a constant, and so on. To generalise any plane, it's some constant times X plus some constant times Y plus some constant times Z is equal to a number. Again, that's the equation of a straight line being pushed through the three dimensions, because if you think about a straight line, it's a constant times X plus a constant times Y is equal to a constant. We just added in the Z coordinate now. So that will always give us a plane. A hemisphere. Well, in two dimensions, that would be our semicircle. And we know that that is, well, we usually have y equals the square root of the radius squared minus x squared. This one here I've made z equals, and if it's z equals, there's the position of it. Its base is on x, y. In other words, it's sort of like opened up in the z direction. If it was, say, sitting on the x, z plane, then it would be y equals, and so on. A paraboloid, so that's our parabola that's been pushed through in the three dimensions, which normally we would see y equals x squared, something like that. So now we add the third pronumeral in. Which one is to the power of 1 all depends on how the parabola opens up. And this one opens up in the z direction. So it's z equals x squared plus y squared. That would be a cone, also opening up in the z direction. So we have z equals some constant times the square root of x squared plus y squared. This is what's called a hyperboloid of one sheet. So it's the hyperbola, but pushed through into three dimensions. You have another one which is of two sheets, so sort of like the other side of the hyperbola. And you'll notice in one of them, when it's one sheet, only one of them has got a negative coefficient. But when it's two sheets, two of them have a negative coefficient. That's how you spot the difference. There's the helix, the actual helix itself, the spiral. And uh, you'll also see, like, you notice they've also made the z a constant t. Sort of which direction is the spiral going? You usually set that as just being the parameter. And then the other ones come out. And this one's nice because it's, a, it's like it's going up a cylinder, this one, because it's constant at the sides. And so each plane is really a circle when you look at it. And so you get similar parametrics to a circle for the uh, X and the Y component there. That shall do us.